वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम शौभिक मुखोपाध्याय फ्रॉम कैलकटी यूनिवर्सिटी टुडे वी विल बी डीलिंग विथ साउथ इंडियन भक्ति मूवमेंट पर्टिकुलरली इट्स ओरिजिन अंडर द पेपर सोशल एंड कल्चरल हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडिया साउथ इंडियन भक्ति मूवमेंट दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फेज in the history of indian religion uh because we will be studying the whole thing in a very short while uh this emerges in the in and around 7th century uh ad and this particular phase is important for the later development of indian religion indic religion had its impact on islam as well so we will be dealing with the origin of bhakti and there our objective will be to study the meaning of bhakti then we will be looking into the origins of south indian bhakti where from it emerged and there we will be looking into the issues of the connection between the tamil classicism as demonstrated in the classical texts like the sangam literature and bhakti how they are related then we will be focusing on the shaiva bhakti as enunciated by the poet devotees known as the nanars or nanmars and uh, the vaishnava bhakti poets known as the arvars we will be also looking into the role of the temples in the emergence of this bhakti movement and finally we will try to assess the social implications of this uh, whole movement that is we will be trying to assess whether it was a kind of social revolution as enunciated by many historians or it was a kind of social negativism what does bhakti mean bhakti in a sense is supreme devotion to god and bhakti was a powerful religious movement which cut across the still powerful current of vedic religion as well as the renunciatory religious movements as the buddhism and jainism is known bhakti has also one important f- fact or aspect that is it's still uh, the importance of bhakti which still runs through the fabric of the indian society the term bhakti is derived from the verb root bhaja which means to participate share that is a bhakta is one who participates in the divine so the divine experience becomes not an esoteric thing outside thing but an internal one the experience of divine is internalized by a bhakta however the great indologist a l basham correctly observes that the native tamil term anbu is closely approaching the christian virtue of love than bhakti is found which is closest to the christian virtue of love which is not uh, replicated in the sanskrit term bhakti so from here onwards we can say that the tamil bhakti movement it had some special features of its own how that we will look into the bhakti movement it started in the tamil country there is a famous shloka in padma puran which says उत्पन्ना द्राविडे भक्ति वृद्धि कर्नाटके गता 
क्वचित क्वचिन महाराष्ट्रे गुर्जरे प्रलयम गता भक्ति एज अ काइंड ऑफ लेडी शी टेक्स बर्थ इन द द्राविड कंट्री ग्रोज अप अबिट इन द अर्ली यूथ इन कर्नाटका इन महाराष्ट्र शी बिकम्स अ फुल फ्लेज और फुल्ली ग्रोन लेडी एंड grows old when reaches gujarat elements of bhakti it is true it appears much early in the shweta shvetara upanishad and a primitive bhakti expressed towards one guru and also the element of physical self violence is demonstrated by ekalavya the concept of bhakti further develops in ramayana and gita which establishes devotion bhakti as the third alternative to ritual action that is karma and knowledge that is gyan as we were talking about uh, where from it emerged there we come across a very tricky question before bhakti emerges in tamil country in tamil literature tamil nad had witnessed the growth and efflorescence of a classical phase as known in sangam literature overwhelming majority of the earliest extant stratum of tamil poetry that is sangam were devoted to two contrasting secular themes of intimate emotions of love aham and virile active world of politics and war that is puram secular theme in the sense that it was directly related with the human emotions there the divine or intervention of the divine does not come in and that's why this sudden shift from secularism to devotionalism from the sangam secularism to the bhakti devotionalism has been explained or suggested by some of the scholars as a major defining feature of the transition that brought the medieval phase in tamil culture naturally this sudden increased preoccupation with religion in the tamil country has been explained by those scholars as an imposition of north indian influences that the north indian uh, elements of bhakti comes in and influences the south indian otherwise or so called secular uh, emotions here one should keep in mind that already some of the relative sangam poems within the sangam corpus the poems which are considered to be written or composed much later these recent sangam poems were devoted to religious subjects for instance paripadal praised tirumal vishnu and tirumurukkarupadai in the pattu pattu uh, section it created a kind of religious geography of murugan preempting the concept of pilgrimage also structurally speaking the bhakti poetry is a direct descendant from the solitary stanza which sangam is known and there a particular genre padantinai praise is considered to be the direct precursor of the devotional praise theme also the first person came into its own in a major way in the sangam poetry where the poet in some of the cases becomes uh, visible 
to the audience and thence to the South Indian Bhakti because there the composer of the Tamil Bhakti uh, poetry they directly express their own feelings and their persona is known to the authors, uh, readers or the audience. Also, the Bhakti poets transformed some of the secular themes in Sangam. This is very important because particularly the theme love in separation has been reworked in the Viraha Bhakti which express the anguish of the separated devotee from the Otios God. Saying all these things that there were some elements in the classical literature which could have continued or metamorphosed into the Bhakti literature it should be kept in mind that it was not simply reworking the classical themes but a metamorphosis was going on within the concept because the Tamil poets not only transformed the concept of bhakti by applying it to the local traditions of miraculous exploits of local saints but they were infusing it with more personal confrontation and insistence on actual physical and visual presence and there was a passionate transference and counter transference. Also the emotional involvement, the pity, desire and compassion of the bhakti gods caused them to forget that they were above it all as metaphysics demands and reduces them to human level as mythology demands. Here I should stop and just explain this thing because in bhakti as it is a love relations there should be two persons available one the god and another the devotee. Now the relation between the God and the devotee as one is loved and another is loving there should be a kind of equality which in the metaphysical world it is not expected that the God who should be a kind of ultimate uh, phenomena they should have some kind of relations with a much lower phenomena that is human being. So in this sense bhakti because by of its uh, getting suffused by the classical uh, theme of love God and the human beings they come into a kind of love relation and the impact we will see in the later uh, part of the lecture. All throughout its journey, Bhakti maintained its Tamil character and thus transported the Tamil qualities to North, transforming Northern Bhakti into a mix of Northern and Southern, Sanskrit and Tamil. So, here we I am actually suggesting that it was not just the North Indian elements making its presence felt in South and Bhakti emerging but I am actually suggesting otherwise that some of the Southern elements transformed the concept of Bhakti and that transformed Bhakti ultimately made its presence felt in the North India. Also there was a folk dimension from the 5th, 6th century of the common era the wandering poets and the saints devoted to Shiva. They were known as the Nayanmars or the Nayanars and Krishna, Vishnu, lovers or po uh, poets uh, and the devotees, they were known as the Arvars. They sang poems in the devotional mode of Bhakti and there is an enormous quantity of 
Shaivite and Bhakti literature of Tamil Bhakti, which is not only an amazing literary and musical achievement, but continues to be a moving force in the lives of the people of Tamil Nadu. Next comes the Shaiva saint poets. They were known as the Nayanars in plural and Nayanmar in singular. The immense dimension of Shaiva Bhakti poetry is canonized in 12 books. They were known as Tirumurai. It begins with the mystic hymns of the great trio. They were known as the Muvar, that is Appar, Sambandar and Sundarar between 6th and 8th century. They were followed by Manika Vazagars, Tiruvasakam and Tirukovayar. And finally, it ends with the hagiographic Piriya Puranam of Chekkadar. Nambi under Nambi, sometime at the beginning of the 10th century, under the instructions of Rajaraja I, the Choda Emperor, collected and classified the songs of the great trio. Their compositions were known as Tevaram, which comprises the first seven books out of the 12 books of Tirumurai. Two great poems of Manika Vazagar. They constitute the eighth book. Ninth book consists of Tiru Visaippa, which is actually the musical compositions sung in the Chola temples in the 10th and 11th century. The 10th book is of a completely different nature. It was composed by Tirumular and it is known as Tirumandiram. His date is uncertain. It was tantric and yogic in its nature, a superb philosophical poem, which becomes the point of departure to the highly interesting eclectic school of the Siddhas. Eleventh book is a compilation of different authors pertaining to different ages. There we find the works of the Shaiva woman saint poet Karaikal Ammayar, who was possibly the earliest among the Shaiva saint poets. And finally, the twelfth book is the Great Puranam that is that was written by Chekklar. Kernel of this book, which is basically a hagiography of the 63 saint poets, Shaiva saint poets, it can be found in the Arur Tirutonda Tohai of Sundarar, which was sung in Tiruvarur in the presence of the Adiyars, slaves of the god. Sundarar calls himself Adiyar Kum Adiyen, that is, slave of the slaves. And Nambi under Nambi's work was the next one in the 10th century. On the basis of these two works, Chekkadar, who was minister of the state, having access to the authentic sources, embellished the stories, life stories of the individual saint poets. And this becomes the truly Tamil Puranam. On the other hand, the Alvars, the Vaishnava saint poets, they were 12 in number. Alvar means immersed in the divine. They constituted another major devotional stream in the Bhakti poetry. Poehai Alvar was the first one. Then came Puta Alvar, followed by Pe Alvar, third of the Trinity, Namm Alvar, Tirupan Alvar. Both belonged to the low castes, and the latter was untouchable. The other prominent Alvars include Tirumangai Alvar and Tirumavisai Alvar. Besides, there were persons like Peri Alvar, who was a Brahmin and also known as Vishnu Sittar, and his celebrated daughter, Andal. Most famous of the Alvars is Nam Alvar, whose devotional outpourings called Tiruvai Moli was compiled and codified by another Vaishnavite saint, Madhurakavi. The Vaishnava Bhakti poetry, similar to the Shaivite Bhakti poetry, was codified 
and this massive tome of 4000 hymns they are known as nala ira divya pravandam that is 4000 pravandam or uh, literature which consists of mudal airam foremost thousand the first thousand irandam airam the second thousand mundram airam the third thousand and nangam airam the fourth thousand and this composition was compiled by Nathamuni again in the 10th century this contains compositions of all 12 alvars and its importance in the Vaishnava religion is such that it is called or known as Dravida Veda that is the Veda of the Tamil country in the emergence of bhakti we have seen the role of the classical literature another aspect we should keep into mind that is the role of the temples the bhakti compositions were clearly meant to be performed both in homes and temples growth of bhakti is intimately connected with the efflorescence of sectarian temples possibly this could have been an imitation or response to the widespread Buddhist practice of building stupas or Jain and Buddhist practice of the veneration of the statues of the enlightenment enlightened figures. One of the innovations in Bhakti was the shift, shift of the center of public activity from the courts to the temples. Earlier the poets were singing in the courts of the kings, now they are singing in the temples. Because of this temple centric uh, development this resulted in a competitive fundraising among the rival religious groups for building religious centers earlier the kings they were funding the buddhists and the jain religious centers now with the emergence of the bhakti temples they were asking for uh, funds from the king and this resulted in a intense struggle between the buddhists jains and the bhakti saint poets under the Pallavas, temple, temples began to grow into temple cities. Narasimha Varman, the first Pallava king, began building the great temple complex at Mamallapuram. Rajaraj the first, the imperial Chola ruler in the 10th century, began building the great Shiva temple in Tanjavur, completed after his death in 1012. Subsequently, Rajendra the first, the Chola emperor, built another monumental temple at Gangai Kond Cholapuram, the new Chola capital. The Cholas could have been inspired by the examples set by the Rashtrakutas at Ilora, that the state uh, temples coming up. These temples were major economic ventures with kings donating economic resources spread all over the imperial domain. They were major source of employment for the community as well, with a number of accountants, guards and ritual functionaries employed there. And there in the temple, because of the emergence of an institution where these bhakti poetry was being sung, South Indian bhakti religion thus under the Pallavas and the Cholas benefited from the royal patronage. The Cholas regarded themselves as the reincarnation of Vishnu but were by and large the worshipper of Shiva. Thus Vishnu, the god manifest, became a devotee of the Shiva, the god aloof from the world. As a subject was to the king, the king was to the god and thus we find a great chain of bhakti being created but here also we should keep in mind the king also was identified with the god because koil temple the tamil word for temple koil it means it is a kind of a compound word consisting of il that is house and ko that is the king so it was the king's house or palace which 
becomes the temple. So kingship provides or provided one model for bhakti. From its very inception, the divine was superimposed upon the royal and vice versa. On the other hand, if God is equ equated with the king, on the other hand, the bhakta is called tondan, who serves, or adyan, that is slave of the Lord. And the life of the bhakta is of complete self-surrender. Sundarar calls himself Adiyar Kum Adiyen, which can be translated into Sanskrit as Dasanu Dasa. While one of the Alvars projected him himself as Tondar Adi Podi, the I am dust of the feet of the Tondan, the man who serves the God. So here we find that kingship providing a very important model for bhakti. Some of the distinctive features of bhakti is the gender stereotype of woman as gentle sacrificing becomes a new model for the natural worshipper. Some of the Tamil bhakti poets spoke through woman's voice. Nammalvar, whom we have referred to, in a poem, imagines himself as a woman abandoned by Krishna. And this theme, which has been identified as a bridal mysticism, that is, devotee imagining himself or oneself as the married partner of the God, this theme uh, also can be found in the writings of Andal the other greatest, uh, one of the greatest uh, Vaishnavite saint poets, a woman saint poet, uh, Arvar. At the same time, if this is uh, the stereotype, woman stereotype playing an important role for the uh, male follower, on the other hand, a new stereotype arose of the woman who defied conventional society to pursue her personal religious calling. For instance, Karaikal Amayar, the Nayanar or Nayanmar, and Andal becomes the prototype of such deviant behavior. They are, their life, their life story challenges the Manu's statement that woman's Woman should be continuously subservient to following the instructions of her father, husband and son at different stages of life. Now, if we want to assess this whole social movement, whether it was a social protest movement, the question, if not challenging the caste, gender roles and social hierarchies have sometimes inspired the image of bhakti as a social protest movement or a social utopia where the believers, they drown their social markers. Here lies the reason why this religious phenomenon have come under intense sociological and historical scrutiny. The emergence of bhakti coincided with the rule of the Pallava, Pandya and Chalukya rule in uh, South India. It was a period of perpetual strife between them. The cost of uh, administration was increasing. This resulted in uh, demanding of uh, more and more uh, taxes. So it was pressurizing the people and the people they revolted at least this is one of the explanation of the growth of uh, bhakti movement that is uh, this was a, a kind of ideological reaction against the early forms of feudalism and the first established establishment of the stabilization of the caste society so it was a kind of social protest movement 
Among the Tamil scholars, it was probably S. Vayapuri Pillai who first formulated a social political uh, conception of the Tamil Bhakti. Now, in contrast, there are scholars, both Indian and Western, who regard the movement as purely religious and ideological conflict, mostly as a reaction to the renascent Hinduism against Jainism and Buddhism. Now, if we try to balance between these two, one arguing that it was a social protest movement and another arguing that it was purely a religious outburst against the excesses of Jainism and Buddhism, the rough estimate of the caste origin of a number of the Bhakti saints show that a minority belonged to the lower castes and a very few from the untouchables. So, one cannot just say that it was the prevalence of the lower castes or more and more lower caste people coming and that's why this was a kind of social protest movement. But apart from uh, assessing the number of the lower caste uh, people coming into the bhakti fold, more importantly, one part of the message of the Nayanars and the Alvars is the meaninglessness of the caste. So, uh, it is difficult to uh, argue that it was a purely social protest movement. In fact, if there is any caste or class consciousness discernible at all, uh, the importance of the Brahmins compared to the kings and the princes becomes progressively clearly underscored. So, contrary to the egalitarian and the democratic spirit, the most important authors of the movement, surprisingly, were very, very caste conscious. According to Nambi under Nambi, Tirunalai Povar Nandanar, the great Nandanar, destroys the disgrace of his low birth by entering the fire. And according to Chekkadar, who narrates the same story, he tells that God Shiva demands that the poor outcast enters fire and gets purified before he is admitted to the sacred presence. If not out and out social protest movement, Tamil Bhakti movement is permeated with the spirit of social negativism. After a stereotyped description of birth and education, the great moment comes of conversion. The nature of the conflict is usually social and in each episode, the devotee refuses to yield and eventually becomes victorious even sometimes in death. And the Shiva takes the side of the devotee. It may be Sundarar, it may be Manika Vazagar, who and Shiva takes the side of the devotee who protests against the society or tradition. There were devotees who were known as the Vantondan or Vantondar who sacrifices their families, children, their own life without any care. But these people, the Vantondan, they can never be a model to be followed by others. It was rather the soft bhaktas, Mentondar, who goes on living within the society but does not pay any attention to social matters, they become the actual role models. The victory against the society or tradition and the subsequent boon granted to the devotee by God as a gift of grace, a rule, frequently did not lead to full denial of society, to asceticism and renunciation. Hence, it is doubtful whether we are entitled to speak about bhakti movement in terms of positive social protest movement. Social negativism, yes, but an anti-social movement or a revolutionary social protest movement, no. We also should keep in mind certain instances, as I just told, that 
in uh, the Periya Puranam, the antinomian dev devotion of Karnapar who gogs out one's own eyes and puts it on the Shivalinga or uh, the story of Tirunalai Povar, one who will go tomorrow, that is Nandanar, who because of his uh, great dream to see the dancing of Nataraja at Chidambaram, a paraya who went through fire to purify himself. These are some of the themes which has to be looked into, uh, not from a point of view of social protest, but social negativism. Another thing that is the conflict with Buddhism and Jainism. This is another very important aspect of Bhakti movement. In Jainism and Buddhism, the liberation of the individual from the fetters of human bondage was through total denial or renunciation. In Bhakti, this is achieved by total devotion and worship. Like Buddhism and other social protest movements that protested against the injustice of the Hindu social movement, Bhakti movement did not try to change or reform the system itself. Even the non-Brahmin anyone's got tangled with the Brahminic sentiments. So Nandanar gets transformed into Brahmin into a Brahmin, and thus through it, though it vindicates his devotion, it upheld the exclusion of the Parayas from the temple. And with this, we conclude that with the passage of time, sometimes the caste strictures sometimes reasserted themselves. For instance, Sri Vaishnavism was founded by Ramanuja, accepted caste division in a limited form. Nammarwar, who belongs to a low caste and yet hagiographer claims that he dis detested his social identity. So, in the context of uh, social protest movement, it is very difficult to argue that it was a positive social protest movement. Another aspect, I have just touched upon it, that there was in, in the context of inter-religious dialogue, there was a violent aspect of bhakti. Many of the early bhakti uh, poets, they are very, very categorical in their denunciation of Buddhism and Jainism, which sometimes leads into annihilation of the Jews or uh, Jains or the Buddhists. So, at the end, we can say that bhakti, with all its distinctive features, it changed the nature of the inter-religious dialogue and established a kind of hegemony on the uh, social sphere. Thank you.